Five Minute Pearls for Clinical Practice. This week's pearl is called Step by Step. Hello, this is Dr. Brian Morris, and this is 5-Minute Pearls for Clinical Practice, where you will learn the tools to provide exceptional care for your patients. This is the weekly podcast where you will be introduced to time-tested, evidence-based patient care strategies that aren't always taught in schools or training programs, but are nonetheless crucial for success in clinical practice. And each podcast episode is about five minutes. This week's pearl is called Step by Step. In clinical practice, we often meet with patients who have many habits that need to be addressed. Perhaps a patient might smoke, or be sedentary, or be 50 pounds overweight, or be sleep deprived, or eat loads of processed unhealthy fast food. The question arises, what do we do when we meet with patients who have so many habits that need to be addressed? Back in the 1990s, I attended a lecture given by Dr. Dean Ornish. Dr. Ornish revolutionized medical care when he was one of the first physicians to show that lifestyle changes, such as changes in diet and exercise and stress, could dramatically lower the risk of cardiovascular disease. In that lecture, Dr. Ornish recommended that clinicians encourage patients to make wholesale changes by adopting a comprehensive set of different lifestyle changes outlined in his program. So after hearing that lecture, I went back to my practice and I tried it out. I would meet with patients and give them diet recommendations, exercise recommendations, sleep recommendations, stress recommendations. I gave them a lot of recommendations. I was so excited to see what would happen. I thought my patients would come back a few months later and have made wholesale changes. To my surprise, the patients came back to meet with me, but sadly they had made few if any changes. The story was much the same, patient after patient after patient. My patients started well for about a week or two or three or four. They actually stuck with the program, but invariably something happened in their lives and they ended up back where they started. The recommendations were simply too vast. There was too much for the patients to handle. And when one thing fell apart, the whole enchilada fell apart. So over time, I eventually realized that there is another way. I have tremendous respect for Dr. Ornish, but I have found that it works much better to give patients small steps, small habits to work on. I began to recommend one or two changes per visit, and miraculously, patients started to get better. Rather than making multiple recommendations at a given visit, I might say, Let's work on having no fast food for this month. Or I might say, let's work on having an extra portion or two of fruits and vegetables each day. Or I might say, let's work on getting seven hours of continuous sleep this week. It would depend on the patient and what they were prepared to accomplish. But I found that patients were much more able to implement small, manageable changes than wholesale, comprehensive changes. This isn't to say that every patient fits into this profile. There are some patients where comprehensive changes are the best thing to recommend. Those patients are typically the ones that come into your office and seem fully committed, who seem fully engaged, who have had a mind-altering experience and now are ready to make wholesale changes. And if a patient comes to me and says that they're ready to make a whole slew of changes, I'm willing to listen and work with that. However, most patients are simply too busy and not motivated enough to make wholesale changes, and these patients do much better if you give them one or two targeted recommendations each time you meet with them. So what are the keys when you present small manageable steps to patients? I have come up with five important criteria that you should think about when you start to present small manageable habits to your patients. The first is the habit should be an action item and not an attitude. So for example, I try to avoid saying something like eat more fiber to patients or 
get more sleep, or reduce stress. Now, those are all nice recommendations, but they need to be action items, very specific action items. Try to stay away from recommending attitudes or general concepts to patients. Focus on action items. So for example, if your patient is sleep deprived, you might say, let's focus on getting seven hours of continuous sleep per night. If a person is not getting enough fiber in their diet, you might recommend having a bowl of oatmeal and an apple every day. Whatever the recommendation is, make it an action item, something tangible, something that they can do right away. Number two, Make sure your patient knows exactly why you are recommending this habit to the patient. So if you tell the patient they need to get more sleep or they need to wear their CPAP machine because they have sleep apnea, make sure that they know why it's important. So you might say to the patient, you need to wear your CPAP machine every night because getting suboptimal sleep is a risk factor for heart disease. So by improving the quality of your sleep, you are reducing your risk of cardiovascular disease. Putting it in clear terms to the patient so that they can understand why they need to follow your recommendations will help dramatically. Number three, make sure that the habit that you recommend to your patient is something that the patient is ready to do. If you have a patient who is smoking two packs of cigarettes a day and is not ready to stop smoking and you tell that person to stop smoking, it's very unlikely that that person will succeed. Try to find the habit that the patient is ready to adopt right now. If the patient is ready to stop smoking, great. Work with the patient to have them stop smoking. But if the patient is not quite ready yet, try to find another habit that the patient might be ready to accomplish. Number four, try to make this all fun. Try to find a way to make the new habit a fun experience or at least link it to a fun experience. And lastly, number five, make sure that you find a way to help the patient make this habit, this new habit, convenient for his or her schedule. I have found, and I'm sure most would agree, that patients will have a much more difficult time adopting a new habit if it is very inconvenient to their schedule. So if you're recommending more activity to the patient, think of a way that you can make this more convenient for the patient. Perhaps they do have an extra half hour every morning, so that might be a good time for them to go for a walk. Or perhaps they have a little time around midday, around lunchtime to go for a walk. That might be a good time to recommend that they get their walk in. Try to find a way to make this new habit convenient to the patient's schedule. So those are the five criteria to think about when you recommend a small, manageable step to the patient. Make sure that your new habit is action-based. Make sure that the patient understands why it is important for their health. Make sure that this new habit is something that the patient is ready to tackle Try to make sure that this new habit is somehow a fun experience or at least linked to a fun experience. And lastly, make sure that the new habit is somewhat convenient to the patient's schedule. Although every patient is different and some patients will be ready and prepared to make wholesale changes in their habits, I have found that most patients are best prepared to focus on one or two habits at a time. Try to encourage your patients to make small incremental habit changes and then the success that they have with these habits can be built block by block by block over time and before long these habits will build on each other to create the sort of comprehensive lifestyle change that promotes optimal health. Let's keep the dialogue going. Let me know what you think of this week's Pearl for Clinical Practice. You can email me at drmorris at 5minutemd.com. That's D-R-M-O-R-R-I-S at 5minutemd.com. You can post your comments and your experiences on the 5 Minute MD Facebook page. You can actually also post comments on the 5 Minute MD website now, which is at 5minutemd.com. And also you can follow us anytime on Twitter at Brian Morris MD. Let your friends and your colleagues know about the podcast. And you may want to make sure that you're subscribed on iTunes. If you're subscribed on iTunes, you will receive future podcast pearls as soon as they are posted to iTunes. Thank you so much also for all the wonderful feedback and support 
that we are receiving. And of course, stay tuned for future podcast pearls. And until then, I will see you at the next five. Thank you.